Here we are, and we're excited to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together this morning. If you're joining us as a guest, we're so glad you're here. We hope you feel welcome, that the service is helpful for you and an encouragement to you. And one quick favor to ask of you is to go to our website at gracebible.com and go to the Connect button and let us know that you were here. And that's just a way for us to uh, be able to follow up with you and get a conversation started with you if that's what you want, and see if there's anything that we can do to help you or serve you or pray for you in any way. Just a few quick announcements. First off, our playground is still under construction, as I'm sure you saw coming in, and I'm still waiting on my fence guy to complete the fence, but as soon as he does, I'm going to need a crew to help me lay weed barrier and wood chips. So um, if that's something that you could help out with, please let me know. I'd like to get a crew together. It might be this weekend, just to just to get that finished so that our kids can enjoy the playground and, and uh, it can look nice out there once again. Also, we have a parent-child dedication coming up uh, just a couple weeks away, October 25th. If you have a child that you've yet to dedicate and you'd like to, we'd invite you to uh, reach out to us so that you could participate in that event. Feel free to RSVP to the website that's on the screen there. It's also in your weekly email as well. And we would love to be able to share that special day with you. Also coming up, we have a Grace Life next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. So Grace Groups will be off for the week, but we will have a Grace Life meeting here just to get, give you some updates on things that are happening and uh, just to share some fellowship with your fellow church members. So I invite you to, to be out here for that. And then also one final reminder that we are done doing registrations for our worship service. So no longer will that be required. Um, but we will still require registrations for our kids' classrooms. So if you have kids, you will still need to register them uh, just because of of our um, capacities that we have put in place. So uh, before we begin our worship this morning, uh, we would like to get an update from our All Nations team, and Tim Fuller is going to do that for us. That's right. Good morning. Uh, My name's Tim. I'm with the All Nations team, and you guys are probably getting used to seeing me come up here pretty frequently. Well, that's because God is just tremendously blessing us, and we're able to bless other people through that. So uh, last month, you heard me bring up and introduce we took on a new partner, the Davises. Well, I'm here to announce we're taking on another new partner as well. So we're taking on Dwight and Melissa Ruley. They are stationed in Casablanca, Morocco. Been over there for about nine years. And our support is directly going to be uh, funding their radio ministry, as they put it. Now, it's a bit unconventional. It's very unique, not something you would expect uh, in Morocco or northern Africa. Uh, But the Rulies were kind enough to go ahead and make an introductory video for us and explain a little bit about uh, Casablanca, their ministry, and what we will be funding. So uh, we'll go ahead and play that now. And I would really encourage you, please, 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 Uh, be in prayer for them. They are in a very dangerous part of the country, and they'll explain a little bit about that as well. Hello, Grace Bible Church. My name is Dwight Woolley, and we are here in Casablanca, Morocco, and I want to thank you guys for your new partnership with us and our work to expand the gospel here in Morocco. I want to take just a couple seconds and introduce you to our family. So first we have Jasmine. Hi, my name is Jasmine. I'm three... I'm five years old, and I have your notebook. Hi, my name's Jackson. I'm nine years old, and I have a judo class here in Casablanca. And I'm Melissa, and we look forward to getting to know you guys, and we just wanted to say thank you. Morocco is open for business. In the last 10 years, Morocco has made great strides in tourism, banking, commerce, industry, and technology. The Moroccan economy is growing, and it's been recruiting outside sources to help it continue its modernization and its growth. You are welcome in Morocco for almost any reason, except to advance the gospel.
Morocco is trying to promote itself as the champion of moderate Islam. Morocco has actually broken with a lot of Islamic tradition and made advancements in things like women's rights, as well as embracing different aspects of Western culture. But still, Islam is truly at the heart of everything. In May of 2019, the Pope made an official visit to Morocco. And there was kind of this silent hope that this might actually be the perfect time and the perfect platform for the Moroccan government to officially recognize that some of their citizens, some of their Moroccan people are Christians. The king went on to make a speech in which he proclaimed himself to be the guarantor of the freedom of religion in Morocco, which is wonderful, except for the fact that he went on to delineate that he gave the right to Muslims, Moroccan Jews, and foreign Christians who are living in Morocco, thereby cutting out and not recognizing Moroccan Christians. Morocco is a very difficult field. The church that we're trying to see grow, that we're hoping will germinate here, it has to be invisible. It has to be in the shadows. But just because it's invisible, that doesn't rob it of its power. Even though it's small, we're seeing it growing. This field definitely has its unique challenges. We can't just be here as gospel proclaimers. And so I started a business so we could have visas to live here in Morocco. Dwight shoots video for YouTube channels, for small businesses. He's building a little creative company here. Having tools for production lets us make media in-house and it lets us take our gospel message out of the shadows and put it into the public face of social media. We use it like a giant sales funnel. We get contacts by advertising on Facebook, get people to listen to our content, and then we funnel them down from there to people who are willing to contact us, communicate with us, and we work to take our online communications offline, make it personal, meet them, and one-on-one -on -one explain to them the gospel. Discipleship here, it has to be in person, one-on-one, -on -one, and it takes time. And every new believer is at square one. It takes time to walk with them as they start to grow. Christianity is such a minority here. And since Moroccans are not recognized as being able to be Christians, they fall into a legal limbo. And this makes them easy targets for persecution and general discrimination. There are so few Christians in Morocco. And even though they are not recognized by the authorities or by the government, together, we are the body of Christ. morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We're so excited to worship with you this morning. It's so good to see more seats in the building. I'm going to read Psalm 149, 1 through 6, which is uh, the beginning of a chapter of the Psalms that just expresses how we are to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let his faithful people rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouths. Let's stand and let's sing these praises to our God this morning together as his people. We've seen the things 
to wander to the things that cannot and will not satisfy our own flesh. O King of kings and Lord of lords, how we desperately need you. O King Jesus, you are the one that came to seek and to save the lost, which was us, all of us. And now and today we want to proclaim the new heart that you have given us, how you have changed a heart of stone to a heart of flesh how you changed a path of transgression to a path of righteousness, how you have changed a destiny to hell to a destiny of eternal bliss with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yes, we will bless your name. Yes, we will sing for joy. Yes, we will choose to praise you and to glorify you all the days of our life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. We're starting a series today on King Jesus. So the next two songs we're going to sing are praising him as our king. All hail the king. So let's sing together these songs of pure ascription to God, our king who reigns.
And yet, we just want to say it again. We want to declare that you should be crowned Lord of all. That you are worthy for a God who could create a world like this, to create people like us, to put in us desires and hearts that love you and want to find something. All of the world is looking for something. All of us were programmed, were made to worship something. And Father, we declare that that something is the someone of you. 
And so as we step into this series thinking about the authority of Christ, we pray that you would give us just a great sense of what it means to be under that authority, to delight in worshiping that authority, to live in the safe bounds that are drawn up by that authority. May we see you in a new and fresh and beautiful way over these weeks. And that we might, in our hearts, just crown you again and again, Lord of all. So uh, help us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Welcome to Grace. My name's Eric. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are honored that you would join us in bestowing those crowns verbally, in recognizing that awesome authority together. As we start today, I want to ask you a question. Where were you a year ago today? In your mind, get a sense, where were you a year ago today? Let me, let me give you some context Let me give you some headlines from October 4, 2019. At that time, as we watch the news, uh, President Trump may have committed an impeachable offense. That was the headline. We, We know where that went and what that took our country through. The movie Joker was expected to break box office records, and it did. It was the highest grossing R rated movie of all time. A health scare for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had people speculating about the political crisis that might follow if she were to pass away. People were talking about that, and, well, that's really true. If this woman stays off her smartphone for a year, she wins $100,000. She did it, and she won. And, of course, probably the most important, the McRib is back at McDonald's. That's what had the nation's mind a year ago uh, today. And now it's 2020. And boy, are there different headlines. As the overused phrase goes, unprecedented times. We saw the fruits of impeachment. We have seen pandemic with all that it has brought The name George Floyd, protests, financial collapse in so many sectors, forest fires, and in just the past few days, the worst presidential health crisis since Reagan was shot. A lot happens in a year, and that's just nationally because each of you has your own headlines. Each of you has what you have gone through in 2020. The question is, would you have wanted to know what was coming? If we'd gone a year back and somehow we could peer into the future and see 2020 coming, would that have been a good thing? Or would that just have been anxiety and dread for all that was to come? And now that you're in the middle of it, how does knowing Jesus and the fact that He is King, how does that affect how we live through this year. See, we're about to watch Jesus tell some of his followers the future. We're about to give, watch him give them a picture of what's coming, and it's not good news. He knows the future, and he rules over the future. The fact that that is good news, and that's what this series is going to be all about, King Jesus, over the next five weeks. And so, We're going to start with this picture of him ruling over the future. If you'd open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 31. Luke 18, 31. 18 is the the chapters in the Bible, big numbers, and then the little numbers are verses. We're looking for verse 31 in Luke chapter 18. And we're going to see three tragic stories today. You get three sermons for the price of one this morning, and three happy endings. And the endings are happy because of the title of this sermon, Jesus is King over all. If it weren't for the authority of Jesus over the brokenness of this world, then there would be no true happy endings for these people so long ago, and really not much hope for us in this broken world. So if you're able, I'd invite you to stand in honor of reading God's Word. I'm going to read the first two of these stories aloud, and we're going to ask God to teach us. 
Luke 18, 31. Taking the twelve, Jesus said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For He will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging Him, they will kill Him. And on the third day, He will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As He drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And Father, we give you praise right now as we watch this story through the eyes of history. We pray that we would see your glory now in a clear way. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. Hopefully you got some notes on the way in. You can follow those as we go. First off, I am happy to report, number one, that Jesus is king over history. Jesus is king over history. Jesus has just arrived in the first story in the city of Jericho. He's on his way to his historic moment in Jerusalem. And man, is he in for an uphill climb. I mean, literally, it's all uphill. It is a long, long way. Jericho is one of the lowest cities in the entire world, one of the oldest cities below sea level. And Jerusalem is up in the mountains, 2,450 feet. It's a nine-hour walk uphill. So when Jesus says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, that's what he means. So he gathers his inner circle of followers, and he begins to speak of the prophets, but then he also starts to speak as a prophet. Verse 31, he says, everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. That's the Old Testament, all the prophecies and promises and the the systems and the sacrifices and the temples and the tabernacles and the law and the lawgiver, everything is pointing to the desperate condition of man and his desperate need for Messiah. All of that, thousands of years of preview, is about to be accomplished in Jesus. And so he, he speaks of the prophets, but then he makes his own prophecy of sorts, like we mentioned earlier. He gives them a preview of, of what's waiting in Jerusalem, and it's almost all bad news. You can see it right there in your notes. The Messiah will be delivered over to the Gentiles, mocked, shamefully treated, spit upon, flogged, killed. This is not going to go well. Now, the first question, whenever you read a passage in the Bible, you, you say, why is this in the Bible? Like, why did Jesus give them this preview when he didn't tell them about certain other things that would happen? Well, if I told you last year about how bad 2020 would be coming up, what would that tell you about me? Yeah, at minimum, it would tell you that I can see the future, which would be pretty cool. But if the prophets wrote about it, and I just spoke about it, and I see it's about to be accomplished. That word has more than just seeing in it. That word has intent. There's a plan being worked out here, and someone is in charge of that plan. It's just as Luke says in the sequel to the book of Luke, the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 2. Luke writes, this Jesus who was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. That's the one that you crucified 
and killed by the hands of lawless men. Though you did this, God ordained it. There's a plan for all of history. So as we approach Easter in the spring of next year, we're, Lord willing, going to go through these stories in detail. We're going to walk with Him all the way to the cross. But for now, because we do know the story, we can check a few of these off. He says that He would be betrayed, and sure enough, He was betrayed even by trusted people and delivered to the Gentiles. That's a check. He said He would be mocked. The King of the universe would be dressed as a scorned king, a pretend king, and be mocked. That happened. That's a check. He was shamefully treated, stripped naked, and scoffed at. Check. He was spit upon, a pretty gross thing to us, but a sign of just terrible derision and disrespect in their culture. He said it would happen, and it did. Check. He was brutally flogged, beaten with a a horrible, tortuous whip, beaten so badly he almost didn't make it to the cross. Check. And then, of course, he did make it, and then he was nailed to that cross, and he was killed. A check that no one could imagine But in all that sadness, there was a plan leading to on the third day he will rise. You can't be resurrected unless you're dead. So the plan had to take him there. A plan that was laid out before the dawn of time in the mind of God. A plan being fulfilled before their very eyes. But a plan, this is important, that they could not perceive. In fact, even Jesus saying those clear words that we could all check off. Verse 34, when they heard him, it says they did not understand them. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. It's not that they're dumb. It's not that the words coming out weren't clear. There's some kind of supernatural intent here to hide the meaning because they're not ready for it. I'm sure someday they would look back at this and say, wow. Look what he said, and look what happened. When you see that, you realize that Jesus is king over history, even when we can't see his plan, even when that's not visible to us. It was true then, and it's true now. Two things I found interesting looking at this text. First off, people who are skeptical about the Bible, one of the things they have to deal with is prophecies. Like, what do you do when they say something's going to happen, and then later it happens? And of course, one of the main ways they try to get around that is to say, well, uh, Luke wrote this later, so he knew what was going to happen. He just cheated and went back with 20-20 hindsight and made up those prophecies. But I want you to notice here the, the references. Most of them are from Luke, but two of them are not even in Luke's account. Two distinct details, being spit upon and being flogged. We have to go to the Gospel of Mark, or the Gospel of John. Now, just think, if you're Luke, you're making the whole thing up, you're writing this to convince someone, you're going to make this awesome prophecy and you're going to have every one of them happen, right? Or you just quote what Jesus said accurately and God in His kindness shows us all the details through many different lenses. You see that? Do you see how that makes it more authentic that this was a true prophecy? Second, notice what they call Jesus. We've seen this a lot as we've studied Luke. They call him the Son of Man. It's a funny way for him to kind of speak about himself when he is teaching. It's a phrase that likely comes from the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, where the prophet wrote, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days. And was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So this son of man picture, it starts in the Old Testament and is filled with all kinds of prophetic 
meaning. It's all about being king. It's all about dominion and authority. Predicted from long ago, he's now living out those predictions. Jesus is king over the very events of history. He's planned his own execution in order to plan his own resurrection, in order to plan our redemption. It's amazing. And that means that Jesus is also king over 2020. He's king over everything that's hitting us in the news. He's king of everything that's hitting you in your life. It's all under a plan. Virus, protests, wildfires, elections. The most powerful king on the planet, our president, can have all his plans thwarted by a microscopic virus. And yet, the plans of the king of the universe are underway, completely on time and on schedule and for the most part, invisible to our human eyes. We're right where the disciples were. We can't see. But what is visible is what this text teaches. There's a plan, not random. Evil will not win. God is working all things for the good for those who love Him, which means that whatever crazy things are coming in tomorrow's paper, Jesus is King and that should give you courage. And that should give you peace. It should make you complain less and rejoice more. If, if you and I could get our focus off the pathetic conflicts and controversies and conspiracies and instead spread the reminder of God's sovereignty and goodness and trustworthiness that He's in control. Oh, if our feeds could be filled with that kind of Christian hope. That's what we learn from a text like this. Tomorrow may be a long uphill walk, but it's all leading to God's good and perfect ending of the story. And if that's not good enough, I have even more good news. Number two, Jesus is king over the sickness in our bodies. Jesus is king over the sickness in our bodies. So, second story, they're in Jericho, uh, they meet a blind man. The book of Mark tells us his name is Bartimaeus. And we've seen these healings so many times now that it, it almost becomes commonplace. You almost take them for granted, but just, just realize what we're about to see. Bartimaeus is blind and begging with no hope. The sickness in his body, his eyes, cannot be helped by the medicine of his day. And so all that's left for him to hope for is whatever ends up in the tin cup that he holds out each day. He is totally at the mercy of the generosity of the world around him. Will he eat today? Will he live to see tomorrow? Well, he won't see tomorrow. Or will he? There's some noise. He asks what's happening. They tell him that it's this Jesus of Nazareth. He knows about Jesus because he calls out, verse 38, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So the man with no hope actually has a glimmer of hope. And then the crowd tries to quiet him down. Don't disturb Jesus, but the man is, he's desperate. He, he plows through with his voice. He will not be silenced. He says, son of David, have mercy on me. And then there's this touching moment where Jesus goes to him, asks him what he wants, and he tells him, and Jesus says, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. And when they saw it, they gave praise to God. The man believed in Jesus Jesus showcases that faith with a miracle. And there's actually more to it than that. A man, listen close, a man who was physically blind was also spiritually blind. God opened the eyes of his heart to put his faith in Jesus. You just don't see that because it's on the inside. So God demonstrates it with this external miracle. He opens the eyes of his head so people could give God glory. But he goes, he's very careful to say, I'm healing you because you have faith. The healing is just evidence of the faith that you have. 
What happens when people truly see, they give glory to God. So what we can learn here is that Jesus is king over the sickness in our bodies, even when we can't see any hope. The reality is the brokenness of this world extends into our own bodies and minds. We don't just see a broken world around us. We feel a broken world in us. When we come down with a virus or with aches and pains or a headache or we fight a brave fight against cancer, all of that is us living out a broken world. Some of us find our joy hijacked by depression or our peace hijacked by anxiety or our mental focus hijacked by obsessions or perhaps someday our mind that gets taken captive by dementia. We all face sickness in our bodies. It's not how it was at the beginning. That's not how it will be for eternity. But in between, we live in a world and we live out a broken world in our bodies. And a text like this gives us a blind man who literally can't see the hope standing in front of him. And some of us are facing physical sicknesses and we see no hope at all. You know what's amazing? That every day our bodies are invaded by viruses and bacteria and threats that you and I will never know about. Just every day God works the thousand miracles, sending out His royal legions of white blood cells to to fight off all kinds of things that are constantly a threat. 99.999% of the time, God spares you and me. But every once in a great while, God allows something to get through. He has purpose and plan for all. It could be like the blind man we saw in John 9 whose sickness, Jesus overtly tells us, the reason you're sick is so I could heal you so God can get glory. That was the reason. It could be like the thorn in Paul's flesh in 2 Corinthians 12. Many theologians think it was some kind of illness. And its purpose was to keep Paul humble. I mean, maybe God has given you a condition that makes you trust him more. Or or maybe he's given you something that will make you trust others more. Or give others the opportunity to serve you, to bear that burden with you. Sometimes sickness is just a test from the devil. We saw that in the book of Job. Sometimes sickness marks the finish line of life and ushers us into eternity. It is appointed for all men some day to die, and sickness might be the way it happens. But one thing, it is not. It is not an accident. It is not outside of the loving reign of the king. Even when the purpose is hidden and you can't see the hope, Jesus is still king over sickness, and we should still cry out in his presence to heal us, sustain us, even when he doesn't. I've already mentioned our president a few times. Uh, The Bible commands us to pray for our leaders. And when the leader of our country is very sick, uh, we should pray. And so I want to pause right now, and let's, let's pray for our leader and ask for Jesus to bring healing to him. Father, we pray for our president. We admit and believe and rejoice that you are king over all sickness. And we don't know all details, but we do know that uh, the leader of our country is sick. And in a way that could be uh, very serious. And so, Lord, we pray uh, that you would heal him of this sickness. We pray that it would be gone quickly, that it would not cause uh, an upset to our nation, that you would uh, keep our nation peaceful, even though some days it looks anything but. Lord, we know that you restrain so much evil that we never even see. We pray that you would uh, bring him back to full health and him be able to uh, fully lead. And we pray that uh, you would give him wisdom to make wise decisions, surround himself with wise people and to move us forward in wise ways. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, two quick observations before we leave this point. Notice 
The man calls Jesus the son of David. If you don't know the story, David was an Old Testament king, probably the most well-known. He's one to whom God gave great promises that someday Messiah would come from his line, would save the world from evil, a great king it would be. This blind man who is Jewish is making a strong messianic claim when he says that, crying out for mercy. He believes this is the Messiah, the son of David. Second, this is the final healing miracle in the book of Luke. It's a fitting end to this stage of his ministry. If you remember what started this was a sermon that we studied months and months ago that he preached in Nazareth in Luke 4 where he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, lib- proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He said that's all he would do. Of course, this is quoting from prophecy from before. And now, what have we spent months seeing? We've seen him sharing good news with the poor, the economically poor and the spiritually poor. We've seen him travel proclaiming liberty to those captive by demons and setting them free to those captive by riches. You remember last week, the rich man held captive by wealth. Jesus unlocked his prison door, opened it up, and the rich man refused to walk out, clutching his riches, pulls the door shut, sadly, and stays in bondage. Jesus opened the door. Some people won't take it. Jesus recovered the sight of the blind, those with blind eyes and those with blind hearts. And he has freed those who are oppressed. And we're about to see a beautiful picture of someone tasting that freedom. Let's take a look. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so he gives away his possessions to the poor and teaches us, point number three, that Jesus is king over the sickness in our souls. Jesus is king over the sickness in our souls. Zacchaeus, it says, was a tax collector. We've talked about them. Hated people. And they earned the hate. They were collaborators with the despised Roman Empire. They extracted and extorted money from their own countrymen. This guy's a tax collector, but not just that. He's the chief tax collector for his area. So he is the chief among sinners. And the text says he's wealthy. And how hard is it for a wealthy man to come to Jesus? Well, we saw that. Camel, eye of the needle, impossible. Like every human being, this man has sickness in his soul, and it has led him to where he is. He's a sinner. Sickness breaks our bodies so that we hurt, and it breaks our soul so that we hurt others, hurt ourselves, even try to hurt God. Zacchaeus is also short. Maybe some of you have noticed the theme through these three stories, people having trouble seeing. Disciples couldn't see Jesus' plan. And the blind man couldn't see the 
Savior right in front of him, and now quite literally, Jesus, or Zacchaeus cannot see Jesus. He cannot see the Savior. So he climbs the famous tree. I once stood next to the tree. They think it was the tree, big deal. And Jesus walks up and sees him in the tree. And then Jesus commits this massive social faux pas. He looks up at him and says, Zacchaeus, come on down, and I'm having a meal at your house today. He invites himself for dinner, which is weird for us. Super weird back then, like way over the top strange and breaking convention. And then the crowd, looking at this, they're especially blown away because, and I won't say this too loud, Zacchaeus was a sinner. Like they weren't. But all of them knew he's the worst guy in the bunch. He's a sinner. Why would an upstanding rabbi associate with a man like this? It's kind of like asking, why, why would a firefighter run into a burning building? What's wrong with him? Why would a paramedic get close to some person who's unconscious or a doctor walk into a COVID floor? Why would you do that? Because they're sick and they're in need of saving. That's why. And Jesus is king over the sickness in their soul. Jesus can forgive them and bring them to repentance. And the text doesn't say it, but I think it's clear it happened again. Another blind man began to see. Because quite suddenly, a corrupt, wealthy, vertically challenged sinner who only pursued Jesus originally out of curiosity is now bearing fruit in keeping with what? Repentance. The symbol of salvation. Verse 8, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. The miracle of sight has taken place. Zacchaeus sees that Jesus is way more valuable than all of his stuff. And different from the wealthy man from last week who stayed in his cell clutching his things, the wealthy man walks through the open door into freedom and begins to distribute his things because his things are worth like nothing now because he has a greater love in what he sees in Jesus. And Jesus confirms my suspicion. Verse 9, today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is king over the sickness in our souls, even when we can't see the Savior. Two final observations on this one. Notice here Jesus is the son of Abraham. Now, the text doesn't quite say that. It says that Jesus says the man is also a son of Abraham. If you don't know his story, Abraham is the, the great Old Testament father of the Jews. The one that God reached down and chose and said, I'm going to make a nation out of your line. And so every Jew is related to this man. Zacchaeus is already a Jew. But Zacchaeus is far from saved when this begins. He's already a biological son of Abraham, but something has changed. In a conflict with the religious leaders we see in John chapter 8, they're kind of talking about this and they said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus looks at him and says, not so much, basically. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. You might have Abraham's blood running through your veins, but you don't have Abraham's heart. You don't have his faith. You're not really a Jew. You don't believe in the Messiah. Abraham was justified by faith. You are not. So Jesus says you can be Jewish and not be Jewish. He says also, that little word's important, also a son of Abraham. And the closest reference to him is himself. That's why I say Jesus is the spiritual son of Abraham. He is in the great line where God would give an eternal inheritance. And as this guy has believed, he says this man is also 
son of Abraham. And today there are many Jews across the planet who are physically related to Abraham and spiritually completely not related. They don't believe in the Messiah. In fact, you heard about our new partner here that Tim was talking about. Our All Nations team is working on another partner. Uh, we, we would love a part of our portfolio of, of All Nations support uh, to focus on the Jewish people, on those related to Abraham but not having the faith of Abraham. And we're not there yet. We're interviewing folks right now, but we would love a part of what our church does to try to point Jewish people to the Messiah, to go to the place that Zacchaeus just went, of putting their faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord willing, we'll have some stuff to announce to you in a few months about how we're going to do that. Second observation, Jesus switches back to his Son of Man title, says he came to seek and save the lost. He's king over the sickness in our souls, even though they can't see him. He has the authority to heal. But I love how aggressive he is as he goes after Zacchaeus. Everybody else is keeping him back. Stay away. Jesus goes right through custom and convention. He sees the wee little man and he says, I'm coming to your house. I'm on a rescue mission to save you from you and to save you from God's wrath. And yet he does it so gently too. Many of you in our grace groups are studying the gentle and lowly nature of Jesus and how he looks into the eyes of rebels who have sinned against God, and he sees them with such compassion and kindness, and he offers them grace. Zacchaeus did not deserve that dinner. He did not deserve that invitation. He did not deserve grace, which is the funny thing about grace. Nobody deserves grace. And Jesus continues to be on a rescue mission if you're not a follower of Christ, he looks at you the same grace-filled eyes that looked into the tree. And he invites you to believe. He invites you to respond. And he invites you to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, to, to change your life. And our prayer is that, that you would believe, that God would open the eyes of your heart and you would fully trust in Jesus. And that it would create such a radical change in your life well, like we just saw, where everything else loses its luster and Christ becomes all and all. And if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't asked him to forgive your sins and to lead your life, oh, I pray you would. I pray you would right now. He wants you to believe. He wants to set you to liberty from your oppression. He wants to declare the year of the Lord's favor, not the year 2020 the year of God's grace in your life. He is king over the sin of your heart. He beckons you to believe. It's why he came. And boy, I pray that you would. Let's stand for closing prayer. Lord Jesus, we bow before the authority that you possess, and we marvel at the kindness and gentleness that you showed when you, having the authority to do so much to punish sin, held that back, were mocked and beaten and spit on and mistreated and killed, all so that you could rise from the dead to pay for all that mistreatment. Just an amazing plan. And so, Lord, I pray for those whose bodies hurt today. We pray for healing. And if not healing, we pray for long suffering and strength to endure the pain. And Lord, we pray for those who look at the, the world around us and cower in fear. We pray you would give them courage to trust you in the midst of this crazy year. Lord, I pray for, for those who hear my voice who may be curious about Jesus but have not yet believed. And we pray you would help them take that step to believe. We praise you. We bow before you, King Jesus, Lord of all. In Christ's name, amen.